Welcome to the first edition of MOPSI Education Forum. Of course, that is the Ministry for Basic and Secondary Education in the Gambia. Um, today we are going to talk about um, some of the overview of MOPSI set up in the Gambia and also the challenges that they are facing and also uh, what are some of the monetary mechanisms uh, MOPSI is using to make so we have quality education in this country. Our guest tonight we have in the studio, uh, of course, uh, on my right here, we have uh, Adama Jimba Job, Deputy Permanent Secretary, MOPSI and Programs. And on my immediate left, we have Maria Machau, who is the Principal Education Officer, Programs. And on my far left is uh, Mr. Andrew Gomez, Principal Education Officer and Head of M&A Unit. So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the program. Thank you. Um, Thank you. First of all, I will uh, begin with uh, Mr. Job. Uh, if you can kindly um, tell us your role and responsibilities with regards to your, your portfolio. Yeah, good evening, viewers. Uh, welcome to the first edition of Education Forum with uh, QTV. I mean, the, 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 uh, my name is Adam Ajimba Job, Deputy Permanent Secretary responsible for programs that is I'm in charge of all programs of the ministry. I coordinate them as the, the figurehead with uh, support from Madam Maria Machau, who is also responsible for, uh, I mean, the, is the PO responsible for programs. But in tandem with her, we are the one coordinating issues that relate to programs and policies of the ministry. Thank you, Mr. Job. And uh, immediate right, uh, Maria Machau. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, as already said, I'm responsible for um, programs, assisting Mr. Job, working with the Deputy Permanent Secretary programs, and with more focus on policy issues and some of the pro specific programs that we are dealing with on access and equity and quality education. Uh, thank you, um, Maria Machau. And of course, on my far right, um, Andrew Gomez. Thank you very much. Um, good evening, viewers. My name is uh, Andrew Gomez, and uh, I am the principal education officer responsible for monitoring and evaluation. And uh, my role is actually to serve as a clearinghouse for the sector that is providing updates as to how well the sector is progressing in terms of programs and in terms of implementation and indicating from time to time the level of achievements against the objectives of the Ministry of Basic and Secondary Education. I have a staff of four and uh, we are collaborating very well to give updates to the sector and our partners. Um, thank you Mr. Gomez. Um, um, first um, I will start with uh, uh, Mr. Job now. Um, to give us um, um, an overview of the MOPSI setup um, in this country. Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, when we talk about the Ministry of Basic and Second Education, uh, basically is headed by the Honorable Minister, which is a political appointment. Mm -hmm. And the technicians start from the Permanent Secretary, who is assisted by two Deputy Permanent Secretaries, I mean, myself and uh, the Deputy Permanent Secretary, Admin and Finance. And then the, we also have uh, 12 directorates, six at regional levels. Every region is headed by a director, and POs and education officers, senior education, education officers go down the ladder. And at headquarters, we have six directorates also, which are the planning and uh, public, they call, used to call it planning directorate, which is responsible for statistics and all other things, budgeting, and all those things are part of the planning directorate. Is headed by a director, but these other units are all headed by a PO. For example, you have the PO budgeting, who is in charge of budgets. They have the PO M&E, sorry, uh, the IFMIS, mm -hmm. and you know, uh, they they are also assisted with senior education officers and education officers. Then the, you have the human resources directorate, which is also headed by a director and the POs. They are responsible for the human resources issues of the ministry. 
You have the standard and qu uh, quality assurance directorate, which is also responsible for monitoring of standards in our schools, headed by a director too. And you have the curriculum research uh, uh, directorate, which is responsible for curriculum development, but also advising the ministry as far as curriculum issues are concerned. I mean, the, this, uh, then the last um, headquarter directorate is science and technology education which is also headed by a director, and then you have principal education officer and education officers that assist them, but mainly the, their focus is uh, supporting the sector in terms of maths and science education in the country. But in addition to that, there are certain units that are also under the Office of the Permanent Secretary, like his unit, the M&E, is directly under the, of the, um, the Office of the Permanent Secretary. You have the TVED unit, which is, uh, you have also the assessment unit. These are all units that are under the Office of the Permanent Secretary. They are not under any directorate, but under the Office of the Permanent Secretary. Then if you go to the regional level, you have, like I said, in all the regions, it's headed by a regional director. And the regional directorate also are responsible, or they represent the Permanent Secretary at the ground level. They are responsible for monitoring teaching and learning in our schools. They are also assisted by I mean, principal education officers, uh, senior education officers, education officers, then the cluster monitors and uh, the principals or head teachers of schools. I mean, uh, the, the school, you know, the organogram starts from the head right down to the caretaker in the school. These are the people that uh, are managing our schools. So in a nutshell, this is uh, the setup or the organogram of the ministry. Like I said, headed by a minister, which is a political appointment. But then you have the permanent secretary assisted by his two deputy lieutenants and then the 12 directorates who in total work for education in this country. Thank you so much for that overview, uh, Mr. Job. Um, uh, I'll, I'll come to you in a moment, but first we'll go to uh, Mr. Andrew Gomez, Principal Education Officer. Um, Mr. Gomez, also um, in terms of education, what are some of the monitoring and evaluation uh, mechanisms that you are using <coughs> to make so you deliver quality education in the country? Thank you very much. As uh, my boss rightly said, the Ministry of Basic and Secondary Education has a concentric layers of monitoring mechanisms. And uh, this, the umbrella monitoring mechanism is the coordinating committee, which is a team composed of the minister, the permanent secretaries, the deputy permanent secretaries, and the directors, as he rightly mentioned. And of course, the principal education officers who are heads of units. Uh, these are various layers at the headquarter level and at the directorate level, either regional directorate levels or so. And basically, you will realize that the coordinating committee meeting goes out every two months to a particular region to monitor and evaluate the progress of the sector at the level of the regions and penetrating up to the school level. Then you will realize that after that layer of monitoring, we also have the directorate level monitoring. As the main layer is monitoring the directorates down to the school level, the directorate level also would have to monitor to the grounds. And uh, they would also be going around to the schools as well as um, other units within the directorates to see how well they are implementing their work plans for the towards the achievement of the sector objectives. And uh, after the directorate level, you have the school level monitoring. The school level monitoring, of course, would involve the head of the school as well as the community because we have what we call the, um, the SMCs, the school management committees, working closely with the schools. They are also another layer of monitoring at the school level. And of course, they will monitor to the level of the classroom and to the level of the child. And then within the school itself, you have department level monitoring. And these department levels also could be subject based. And they would also be monitoring the progress and achievements of the teachers and children within their departments. And then within the classroom itself, the teacher is also monitoring the progress of the individual child. So going through these levels of monitoring, reporting forward and backward will indicate information flow within the sector, which is indicating to us how well we are performing as a sector, right from the grassroots level, which is the child level, which is the nucleus level, 
up to the ministry level, that is to the office of the press, uh, uh, the office of the permanent secretary or the office of the minister. So these are the levels in which my unit, the monitoring and evaluation unit, will be collecting information at various levels, coupled with information that we will get from the EMIS, which is the Education Management Information System, in terms of data. And then we try to analyze, we try to draw tables of progress, and then we try to analyze and give feedback as to how much are we achieving in terms of achieving particular um, targets of our education policy. So basically, these are the levels on the surface. There is more to it in detail, and uh, maybe we will get to that as, 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 you, as we progress. Okay, um, I understand, monitoring and evaluation. So obviously, I think we, how many regions do we have uh, that you are monitoring? We have six regional directorates. Okay. And we also have six headquarter directorates, as we said. In each, in each region? No. Okay. At headquarters, mm -hmm. that's at Mopsi itself in Banju. Okay. That's, that's what we refer to as headquarters. Okay. And let's say Kani thing. Yeah. Right? Uh, we have six headquarter directorates. Mm -hmm. That is the planning directorate, planning policy analysis, research, and uh, budgeting directorate. We also sci we have science technology, mm -hmm. we have curriculum development, mm -hmm. we have standards and quality assurance, we have the HR, HR directorates, okay. and uh, we have the sixth one, uh, science, and science and technology. Right. At the regional level, you have regions one, which is the Greater Banjul and Kanifing, and then you have region two, which is Brikama and Ifonis. Mm -hmm. We also have region three, which is the North Bank, Kerewan as headquarters. And then we have region four, which is Mansa Konko, up to Pakaliba. And then you have region five, north and south, that's Janjambure and um, Kuntaur area council. And then we have region six, which is Base, both north and south. All right. So these are the six regions that we have. But the headquarter directorates also run programs in tandem with these regions. Right? And then the regional directorates also are based in their headquarters. Okay. All right? And this is how they get, they reach the schools. And in reaching the schools, there are other structures in place. Like he made mention of the cluster monitoring system. Every region is divided into clusters, headed by a cluster monitor, who reaches the schools at least twice in a month to visit all the schools. And that cluster monitor reports back to the regional directorate. And it will be interesting to note that every directorate in MOPSI has a work plan that we develop together with them. This work plan is responding to the strategic plan of the sector. Mm -hmm. And the strategic plan is also responding to the education policy like we have 2016, 2030 currently. And it will also be interesting to know that the education policy is responding to the national policy and the sustainable development goals. So we are responding to the global request in terms of education. So the reports coming from these various levels would reach the Office of the Permanent Secretary every quarter. That is reporting on the level of progress on the implementation of the work plan as well as the achievements. So what we do as a monitoring and evaluation unit is to look at the reports that are coming as well as conduct findings as to whether these reports are factually submitted to the Office of the Permanent Secretary. Not a matter of distrusting the reporters, mm -hmm. but we want to verify and be sure that there is no mistake. Right. So this is how we collect information from the directorates, and we will be able to at least give a thorough analysis of the report and advise the Permanent Secretary on the level of progress of the sector. Okay, thank you, Mr. Andrew Gomez. Um, I will come to uh, Maria Machau, uh, Principal Education Officer Programs. Also, in your area, uh, can you tell us the challenges of increasing access while improving quality standards um, in our schools? Well, um, there are inherent challenges when it comes to access because there is clamor for children to be enrolled. We are looking at enrolling every child in all the schools. 
in the process of having more schools being open, obviously you have challenges of numerous challenges of getting teachers into those schools, um, getting teaching and learning materials into those schools, um, having the children attend those schools, keeping them there, sustaining them there, and being able to um, assure quality also that access is open and there is quality. There are numerous challenges. Um, we're trying to respond to those challenges based on what we have on policy because when we work um, most of the issues I've been dealing with um, have been on policy and on strategy, what we have on the strategy plan. I can um, refer back to when we go um, to meet the public in getting our policies ready. Um, these are some of the things we, 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 we get challenges on. The people are complaining about um, there is access, there is no quality, and those are things we are trying to respond to. There are numerous, a host of activities or programs that are put in place to be able to get the, those teachers in schools, in the, the remote areas, be able to transport the children to school, to be able to assist them. Because we, in the, here we have some school buses, mm -hmm. um, there are taxis around, it's easy for children to ride bicycles and go. But when you go up country, you do see children trekking from school to school. We're trying to reduce the distance that children um, travel or trek to school. In, in numerous ways. We are trying to assure quality at school level. And with those ones, we have quite a number of things. Um, teachers be encouraged to go there. Uh, we come there because there are um, numerous initiatives, but I'll be zeroing in later on on the um, hardship allowance, where we have children, I'm uh, sorry, schools that have been suffering from not getting the number, the quality of teachers that we expect to be in those schools, what we are doing to do that. To, to mitigate that, that challenge. Um, we've got challenges of what Mr. Um, Gomez have talked about in monitoring and evaluation. Things that there are um, programs that are put in place in response to that to be able, for them to be able to report back to see that things are working fine. Um, we've got the community participation too, where we have um, institutions that now school management committees, where committees are involved to be able to assure quality, to be able to have the children be in school. There are a host of them. I think we can touch on some, some of them later on. Yeah, yeah. Yes, um, coming to um, ch children like in rural areas, mm -hmm. going to school, I know there are school buses here. Yeah. Uh, do you have the same facility for students in, 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 in the other regions? Because you said you are trying to minimize them. Like I know um, there is something called Recycle UK who bring bicycles and give mm -hmm. to students mm -hmm. you know, in, 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 in rural areas. But what, what, is the, uh, what, what, is, what is the education sector or MOPSI doing to make sure they also chip in like bosses we have here? Just uh, they are all students of the country. So <laughs> what are we doing to also help them? Yeah, we, 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 we know that. It has first I check bike and all those people are coming to chip in we started the ball rolling. Mm -hmm. And that's how we, they've seen that we are doing a bit and they're coming in to help. We've had um, challenges where, um, particularly during the rainy season, before I, come, before I come to distance, we've had a meeting in Wasu some, when we were preparing this policy. Mm -hmm. And some of the parents were explaining, giving us areas where they have to piggyback their children to be able to make them cross some of those pools because the children are too small and it's quite risky. Mm -hmm. um, it's we, we cannot put in buses because it's, it's not available and it's not um, what do we what it's not feasible exactly. for us to be able to have school buses. Mm -hmm. But we've got this initiative, the donkey carts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there are carts that have been, been been manufactured, customized with donkeys um, to take the children to school and bring them back, particularly the small ones. Um, this was introduced in 2012. And it start, we, we've covered schools from Fonyi up to Region 6. And we are starting with the, the, the schools that are most in need. Mm -hmm. And we started with 82, 82 communities, with 82 donkeys, 100, another 100 is coming, and it's working well. People are coming from outside the Gambia now, coming to ask and coming to study about exactly. the donkey cat because of successful donkey cat. The beauty of it is we allow the communities to manage it. We, 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 we sign an agreement with them, agree on how things should be done, when the children should be picked up and taken to school, when they should be taken back, etc. We've got quite a number of them. And another front too is it, it, it gives security to the children. Mm -hmm. They'll be picked up, 
taken to the school and back. There would be no truancy. Exactly. On the other end, um, during the, the Hamatan season, school, um, it gets dark. Mm -hmm. With the donkey cart, it is at the school because when they transport all those children and, and you, it's been used for other, other purposes once in a while, the children are transported from the school and back. The, the, the parents are assured that children are coming, they, they'll be taken to the school and they'll be, they'll be back. In fact, it is more assured than the, the, the school bus we have <laughs> in here, <laughs> if, I, if, I, if I may say. <laughs> Um, that, that, that's, that's, that's one thing. Who, who provides the donkey and the, and the donkey carts? Money and and who, is the, who, is, who is the driver? <laughs> money, money, money is being provided by the ministry from our end. Okay. Um, but the, 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 um, the communities are given the, the chance to, to buy the donkey of their choice. Yeah. And they, there are management mechanisms that we've agreed. Everything is provided by Mopsy. But for ownership, we, we, we fabricate the, the donkey carts, we deliver it to them and they buy the donkey with the money we gi we've given them and it's done. How it is managed, what is expected, and we do go to monitor what is happening. Wh whether the children are taken on time, whether they are taken back in time, etc. The other bit of it again is um, the access road and all. Um, the children, the small children, some of them, it's, it's a problem with access because they cannot walk some of the dis distances we have between their communities to the schools. Mm -hmm. And that is one key thing, that is access. They'll be able to be transported to school and it's assured that the small children, because some of the schools we have from ECD, mm -hmm. the early childhood up to grade nine, we, 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 it's a problem for you to get those small nursery school children to walk at least two kilometers or three kilometers at a time. So the donkey cart helps us in doing that because we are trying to, to make sure that kids are given the opportunity to start from the ECD, the ECD level going up. So that is key. Another thing too about the access, is that before we come back to Donkey Cab, is um, we, we are trying to res respond to what we promised in our, our policy documents, our strategic plan. We are reducing the, the distance between communities and schools. We started, it, it was long, long distances. You have see children walking when they are going up country, walking lost, long distances to school, five to, six, five to six kilometers. But we've reduced it to two kilometers. Right. Now we are looking at two kilometers between the house and, and the schools. That's what we are working on now. Which means you are building more schools. We are building more schools. We are having more challenges for, for quality, but we are working in tandem. That's why we have this program to be able to, schools are being open, but we provide what is expected for us to have quality education. We go with access and equity. Um, okay, um, I'll come to you, uh, the permanent uh, secretary. Um, yeah, Mr. 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 Job, um, um, about the posting of teachers, it still is in line with quality education. Mm -hmm. Okay, some people might say the best teachers are within the combo areas and then in the in the rural areas we don't have good teachers how do you make so you know the level of education in terms of posting teachers is is level so that the quality of education in this area is the same quali quality of education we have in the other areas because uh, i mean sometimes we get information that there are some teachers that when you post them up country they will resign they leave the job because they don't want to to, to, to go there so i mean how how are you, how are you managing with that like how do you post teachers yeah, thank you very much. It's a very <laughs> interesting and very impregnated question. Mm. I mean, the teacher posting is a huge challenge. And as we speak, we're still continuing to look into mechanism as to how to address that. But it is a problem that we are all part of. You, me, everybody. Because of our Maslaha syndrome as a country, mm. we're so small, we know one another. And that makes it very difficult. But remember in our policy we talk about equity. Mm -hmm. That is what is available in Banjul and the Combos mm -hmm. is supposed to happen in Nyamanar. Yeah. Because they are all Gambian children. They have not committed any crime to be born there. Mm -hmm. It's by nature. I could have born in Banjul but I happened to have born in Kedjarga. Mm -hmm. So the same thing. He happened to born in <laughs> Kunguja but he could have born in, in Nyamanar. Mm -hmm. So Polyphon. that being the case, <laughs> we started as a sector, what do we do to attract people to get them there? Because we know that we have the challenge of implementing teacher posting. And there is a lot of interference. With, I would say start from the presidency, right down. We are all part of the problem. 
because they post your wife. Mm -hmm. You knew me, we were classmates, we were going to school together. He called me, ah, Mr. Job, I'm sorry, my wife is sent to Yamanari, you know, if she's gone, my tea, blah, blah. You know, I mean, I know because we are friends, we mm -hmm. have to meet. I naturally would need you tomorrow. Yeah. Then I said, okay, no problem, come tomorrow, see what can we do. Then he will also come, my cousin brother, <laughs> my sister, so everybody comes. At the end of the day, you realize that by the time school starts in September, October, 80% of the teachers you posted are all back. back to combo again. And this is a problem that we are really finding very difficult to manage as a sector. So because of those challenges, we said, okay, let's give them an extra allowance. Mm -hmm. That if you agree to go there, if you are certain kilometers off the main road, we'll give you an extra allowance on top of your salary. I think it has gone up to 45% now in some yeah, area. More than yeah. that. More than that yeah. Yeah. You know, but she, she works on that. She'll be able to give you the figures. That. But even with that, we also <coughs> staff quarters. In some communities, accommodation, teachers, you know, definitely we have to recognize the hardship that those who sacrifice to go to those mm -hmm. communities are really going through. Mm -hmm. I went on track and realized, you know, I said, wow, what? For example, a young lady that just graduated from the college you post this girl to changali lankadi <laughs> in the sandals you drop her on that rough road around six o'clock she has to walk another five six kilometers to get to the village went to the village there is not even a single room that you can sleep in you go to the he will she will go to the alcalos compound mm -hmm. and in the alcalos compound also they have only a title that's what they can avail to you for the ladies, it might be easy. They can say, okay, sleep with my wife. But for the young men, mm -hmm. they end up going to the classroom to sleep because yeah. they cannot allow them to sleep in their houses because, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, it's naturally, it's not because, accepted yeah, by the yeah. culture. Mm -hmm. And as a result, some of them were sleeping in school stores. Mm -hmm. Some of them will partition the classroom, sleep in a person. Tomorrow morning, they remove the curtains for the kids to come in. Because of those challenges, then mom says, okay, let's talk about having staff quarters. quarters yeah. We started also building staff quarters. I mean, then this modern technology of mobiles and everything comes, <coughs> where to charge their mobiles. Mm -hmm. Let's provide them with solar system so that they have somewhere to charge their mobiles. Yeah. But these are issues that are beyond education as a sector. If you talk about ro road network, that is not our responsibility. If you talk about electricity, mm -hmm. it's not our responsibility. If you talk about network connectivity, it's not our responsibility. And these are issues that impact on yeah. our teacher development, I mean yeah. deployment. deployment. Because they're human beings, they have their needs. Yeah. The basic social needs must be provided in certain communities for people to be there. And these are challenges that we are facing as a country, which is impacting on us as a sector. Because you send people up country, they will tell you, well, I don't know where. For example, you tell us, <laughs> Changali Lankari. I mean, Changali Lankari, definitely there is no power supply. No, there is no good road network. Thank God, maybe with the Pasamar uh, Lamin Koto, if that is okay then, at it's least we okay can now. say mm -hmm. there would be some, uh, some uh, network mm -hmm. would be better now. But mm -hmm. think about 15, 20 years ago. What was that community like? Mm -hmm. You know, you go to the community, housing, they live in tight housing. When it's raining at night, like the you saw the sky, you said it's coming. <laughs> a poor guy of a young lady who educated, born in Banjo, educated in Banjo, have never gone beyond Birkama, then you post her there. It's a problem. It's a problem. It the father, the mother, everybody will get up to come and say, please, please don't. Mm -hmm. And remember, we are part of the society too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I cannot say no to everybody, <coughs> despite that I want people to go. Because of that, in around 2007, 2000, Mopsi come up with a strategy of mm -hmm. recruiting people from their communities. And that yeah. was the reason why we have the extended PDC program in yeah. Jambore. Mm -hmm. Because teacher posting was a problem in Region 5, 6 yeah. in particular. Yeah. So we say, okay, let's recruit them from these communities, educate and train them at the extension program. When they are ready, you post them there. But two, three years, you marry them and want to bring them over here. <laughs> exactly, yeah. You see? And the college, the, the teacher training yeah, college. the teacher training college was here. <laughs> because of that, that's why I say we have the extension program. The training was happening in Janjambure. You understand? But they, after two, three years, they tell you, I want to go and do my HTC, I want to go and do my degree program. They have to come to Combo. When we had our posting, 2018, 2019, in Region 1, 
all the big schools were supposed to stop double shift. There was nothing like double shifting mm -hmm. of the teachers. Mm -hmm. They were supposed to double shift the classroom, the classroom and the chairs, the furniture. But the teachers were not supposed to double shift. You go up country, many of the schools were not supposed to double shift because they were giving teachers. There are few communities we still have some challenges, yeah. either we multigrade or we double shift because of it. But by October, even Region 1 couldn't have any teachers there. Mm -hmm. The Rostody College, the Rostody University, and up country, they would come over here. So you go to a school in Combo and Banjul, you have five mathematics teachers. All of them teaching nine periods or eight periods a week. Yeah. You cross the river and go to Bara. There's not a single mathematics teacher. So these are the challenges that we are facing as a sector in our teacher redeployment. And I said, it's not Mopsy's problem alone. It's Bianos. Yeah. Our size as a country is affecting us. Our muscle heart syndrome is affecting us. The disparity in the social amenities is affecting us. Mm -hmm. And unless and until there's equity in all the social amenities, we will still find it difficult to get teachers. With all the incentives I'm telling you, mm -hmm. up to 60% of their salaries is paid as an allowance. This is different from the afternoon shift allowance. This is just an allowance, we call it hard to reach places that we top on their salaries just to encourage them to go. But some of them will just go after one year, two years, then one year I want, I want to come back. Some would tell you, despite all the monetary gains, yeah. I would still want to stay here because here is where I have access to medical facilities, yeah. access to internet, access to running water, you name them. So basically, I think the government need to do double their efforts, like <laughs> building, you know, <laughs> extending the electricity to, to, to rural areas and I then and then so. and then oh, building yes. better schools so. and the road yes. networks, the water supply, you know, that can bring equity. Yeah, exactly. Okay, but I think you want to dilate on, yeah. on what he's I what he's saying. To, I want to just to talk about the hardship allowance because it seems as if some of the teachers are still not aware or they don't really appreciate what it is. Um we it was introduced in two thousand and five, two thousand and six academic year. Because as Mr. Job said, we had problems in equity and it was affecting quality in the, in the system. So like, for example, in 2006, 2005, 2006 academic year, in region, region 5 and 6, the ones which are most affected, you have 35% of teachers for the whole region, only that's their, their portion of qualified teachers. Mm -hmm. In the, um, the region 6, you had only 49%. When you come to Region 1, you have 85% of teachers mm -hmm. um, who are trained. Mm -hmm. So you had those disparities. Okay. That's where we went back to the drawing board and had this hardship allowance. Where um, teachers, beyond school, teachers are serving in schools beyond um, three kilometers beyond um, the the away from the main road yeah. are given 30% um, in Regions 3 and Region 4. Region 5, 35% and Region 6, 40%. We, we let it roll for um, a number of years. Then 2012, 2013 academic year, a study was done. Because when you introduce something, you have to go back, look at it, and see what are the gains, what, what needs to be consolidated, what are the things that you need to change, what are the, the adjustments to be made. And adjustments came up. Because we realized that in as much as we are getting gains, um, they are still going there. But teachers are still clamoring for schools that are within those, that three kilometers range. But you have schools up to the border, and those schools mm -hmm. are suffering. So we've, s we've solved just part of it. <laughs> now, the, the study showed us that, too, that the, the female teachers are unwilling to go. Um, the adjustment made was, one, schools that, are that, that were identified up to three kilometers, their percentages on their basic salary is maintained. But at nine kilometers and above up to the border, they have 10% more on top of that. Then on the other side, the female teachers were having the same bit, but we're still having problems in taking them overboard, taking them, sorry, or on board. They're giving 30%, sorry, a 10% increase on top of what they have. For example, in Region 6, if, for example, those, those who are in, in Diabugo are getting 50%, the, 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 female, the male teachers are getting 50%, the female teachers get 50%. In, in, in solving the two, we realize that we can benefit, we can still capitalize on that because we realize that there are some schools, 
they don't fit the, the, 30, the, the three kilometers off the road, mm -hmm. but they have some difficulties. Mm -hmm. Like some, we have some schools, Yasobo and Jisei in Region mm -hmm. 4. Mm -hmm. They have problems with water. And it's so strenuous. They put taking on board to be able to take teachers there because teachers do abandon the schools because it's difficult. It's the community itself is struggling with water. They have taken on board. So teachers are going there and, and, and boreholes and other things are being put in place so they'll be able to help, plus the accommodation. Um, the, the, the other thing is we, we realize now, when even after the study, that in us, um, teachers are coming now, clamoring to go back to those schools. It's a success. It's being, it's being looked at. Even some of our partners like World Bank, when, we, when they came in, went to the schools. In fact, they, they, they sponsored the study that was done to see the successes. <coughs> it is very successful. Now you want to remove any teacher from the hardship area, it's a problem. Because the, teach, the, teachers, the, 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 the teachers are benefiting from that, that allowance. Um, comparing the, the, the gains now, 2005, as I said, we had 37%, um, 49%, and 80, 85% in Region 1. In the last, the last um, um, one we've had in 2015-2016, we'll be looking at it again. Region, region 5 and 6, which had 37 and 49% respectively, now they have 96.3% of qualified teachers. Our main problem now is keeping them, they're going back and forth, but we don't have a problem now in, in getting the qualified teachers in those areas. Mm -hmm. That's no more a problem. And Gambia College is churning out. Gambia College is teaching, Gambia College is graduating more, more teachers, so we are filling the gap there. So the hardship allowance is something very successful. Some of the teachers, it took them some time, even with the, with the, um, with the canvassing, with the sensitization we did, some of them are still coming down so to ask about it. So this is an opportunity to tell them really, some of them who really still want to go there, they have the opportunity. Because if a teacher stays there for three years, you can come down, but other teachers will still have the opportunity to go. We have teachers who were asked to come back, come down, came down, couldn't sustain themselves, they had to ask yeah, to go back. back. So it's being very successful. Okay, the incentive-based system yes. is, is successful. It is very okay, successful. from teachers, let's come to the students now, um, especially the girl child. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know what the percentage is like because I know before, I mean, there are more men, probably boys in school than girls. But according to your... your, your That's no longer the case. Well, <laughs> wha what is happening now in terms of encouraging girls, you know, or parents to send their um, female children to school? What is the ratio like now um, in, uh, at, at your MOPSI level? Like yes, uh, <laughs> that's, that's um, an interesting one. Um, we feel... Before we used to have um, the gender parity swaying towards the male, mm -hmm. but um, fortunately for the female now, <laughs> the gender parity is swaying to them because it's um, actually around, um, 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 uh, let's say, 52 opposed to 48 for men. So you realize that the gender parity is in favor of the female. We have more female in the in the school system um, but if you look at the different levels you will realize that at the lower basic level that is grades one to six there is almost parity in terms of gender yeah. but as, as you move to the upper and the senior interestingly you have more females in school than the male so that's that that's where we are at the moment well, why do you think that's happening well I believe there was um, a time when we had this uh, free girls education, okay. which started first. And uh, of course, uh, vigorous sensitization was conducted nationwide. And uh, parents were sending their girl child to school. Like stopping early marriage because, and stuff because, like that. Because, because they were, they, their education was free. Mm -hmm. You remember the PEGEP during the PEGEP, former yeah, regime, yeah. which is um, a positive, it's mm -hmm. a plus mm -hmm. in terms of um, encouraging um, female education yeah, and uh, that that contributed a lot towards uh, it boosted up the female population in the school within that time as uh, opposed to the men and then the trend seems to continue because the sensitization still continues and we have gender activists on the ground who are <laughs> very very much instrumental 
you know, um, we have uh, like Fawegam working with the mothers, uh, the mothers' clubs in schools, and they are really penetrating these communities and uh, you know encouraging the women to send their girl children to school, which is actually um, a big plus for them. And uh, when you look at also the completion at the various levels, the completion rate at the grade nine level and the completion rate at grade 12 level, we still have more ladies completing than the men. And uh, sometimes we are supposed to ask the question to say, what is happening to the boys? Because um, you will see that like grade 12 and grade nine, in the past four or five years, there is a sharp downward trend, which we can relate to certain activities of like moving to the back way to Europe, you have a lot of children leaving grade nine, mm -hmm. especially in the North Bank, my boss region, <laughs> mm -hmm. the upper region, region, the central river region, you have a lot of them leaving grade nine to go to the back way. And uh, the same trend is affecting grade 10, 11, and 12. So um, I think we have to do something now to encourage the, the youth, especially the, the boys, to, come to up. stay and uh, come up. Otherwise, the ladies are going <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's, that's fine if, if a man can be a doctor, uh, a, a woman course, also can be course. a doctor. <laughs> so, um, thank you for that, um, um, Mr. Mr. Gomez. I uh, need to add, please, that uh, okay, we have a gender in. unit specific, and, and they're working on programs to be able to mitigate this. There's a special unit that's looking at gender, looking at mm. both boys and girls to see well, what can be done about it. With the, with the ministry? With the oh ministry. Yes. Yeah, but uh, let me put it. When it started, it was <laughs> girls and girls education. <laughs> <unit. Okay. laughs> so then there was this strong advocacy, very aggressive, yeah. <laughs> towards the girl child. Mm. And that in some communities, particularly the giants, decided to withdraw the boys mm -hmm. because the girl was free. And I could okay. remember it was in around 2010 to 12 that so the ministry said, no, let's also introduce the boys' scholarship. Scholarship, mm -hmm. yeah. Because, you know, <laughs> the girls were overtaking. Yeah. Like I said, the giants and the seconds were asking their boys not to go. <laughs> so to, to mitigate that, they introduced the, 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 the boys' scholarship too. And that almost stabilized it. But as he said, this backway syndrome really affected the completion rate for boys, particularly in these regions he, he, he cited, not Bank, CRR, and URR. URR mm -hmm. you know, because... Uh, uh, people felt that, uh, I mean, Andrew is gone, he made it, so I can also go and make it, which is exactly. an illusion that they only come to realize when they are dead, you know, that it's not, okay. all that glitters is not good. It's mm. True. Yeah. Anyway, thanks for that. Um, again, probably, any of you can answer this, but m probably it could be you. Uh, we are talking about uh, schools again, and then when you come to school, and we, we also have Arabic schools. We have madrasas, you know, that's, that, 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 that are operating. Okay, how are you working in collaboration with those people to see to, to, to that uh, the quality of education there also comes I mean, up? Because sometimes you see um, a student going to Arabic school, but at the end he comes to an English school again. Mm -hmm. Are you involved in monitoring those schools as well? And what, what, what help are you doing to make so uh, we have good education at those places as well? Yeah, we at Bobsy level have the Madras unit, which is mainly responsible for supporting madrasa education. But also we have the Amana, which is an other organization responsible for Arabic Islamic education in this country, we, who are even subvented by the ministry, mm -hmm. you know. But then a uh, few years ago, we have this bilingual program, and then the, we're trying to synchronize our curriculum. Because what we felt was, uh, we want everybody to be educated. And there were people who were actually against Western education. They prefer their children to go to this Ayla Dara or Madrasa or I Islamic way of education. And we felt education is education. It doesn't matter which medium you use to re receive the instruction. As far as you are educated, that is what we are advocating, that every government child should be educated. And that's why we started working on our curriculum. You know, And then we have, like I said, the Madrasa. And in the alignment of the synchronized curriculum. What we're saying is, we want to make, in a way, the guy, in, uh, that poor boy in the conventional education or in the conventional system, what he's learning in science is the same what this girl in the madrasa learning in science. But the medium of instruction is different. 
When you talk about mathematics, 2 plus 2, whether it's in Mandinga or Wolof or Manjago, it's the same 2 plus 2. Same answer. Same answer you're going to get. And that is what we're saying. Let them be educated in the madras. And uh, at the level of some of them goes to grade 9, because still we are working on trying to how do we assess them. Mm -hmm. It's still a challenge assessing them. Mm -hmm. As we have the Gabese, we have the was still we haven't had an international exams other than the one that is given by Amana. Amana gave them a terminal exams. Mm -hmm. But Amana's certificate is not a certificate that is recognized internationally. And we want as a sector we are working towards what do we do to get the certificates coming from these schools to be a standard one to be recognized all over. So that if they finish grade twelve in Tal a Talindin Islamic school they can go to Qatar or Kuwait or any university and it will be recognized. We are still we're working on that. But we have realized also some of them, after grade 12 in the madrasa, they will just go to grade 9 in an upper middle school, write the exam, have admission to grade 10. Yeah. And they found to be very good students. Very good students. So rather than taking them to the lower grades, you take them to an upper grade where they can just... Uh, continue and write the exams and continue in the conventional school. Because remember also, in this madrasa, Mopsi through Amana is, pay, is posting English teachers. teachers yeah. okay. In all these madrasas, an English teacher is posted to be teaching English to these children so that they have English as a subject. Yeah. Though their medium of instruction, all other subjects it's are Arabic. It's Arabic, Arabic yeah. But English is taught as a subject by somebody posted there by Amana through the subvention that the ministry is giving them. Yeah. So they are recruiting teachers from the Gambia College who went to the Gambia College and pick up appointment and are posted to these madrasas to go and teach English. That is also helping them. If they want to transit into the conventional school, the language will no longer be a challenge because they would have had some background in English language. But like I said, if the mathematics you are learning, the science you are learning in Arabic is the same this guy is learning in English language. So if you go to an English class, I mean, so, sorry, to a conventional school, mm -hmm. and you have some little English background because of it, the subject content matter is no longer your problem. It's yeah. only the language. So and because of the little English they have, it's easy for them to understand, and they can write the exams and pass. Okay. I that, think that on, the, on the side of um, how the madrasas are monitored, um, this uh, madrasa unit um, do go out to monitor the madrasa institutions. And of course, my unit works in collaboration with them as well to go to the schools uh, because of the Arabic background that they have. So that whatever we are looking for, there would be our eyes and uh, we can use our ears as well. Uh, basically, we have what we call the minimum standards in schools. And these minimum standards are meant to <coughs> be used by all institutions under MOPSI. And of course, we have these madrasas under the purview of Mopsi, uh, different from what we call the Majalis, which are different from the Madrasa. Um, we also are cognizant of the Majalis and try to encourage them so that they can come up to the level of Madrasas and be recognized and be um, part of the... Majalis, is that the one they have at home? So yes, the ones they the have at home, at home and the Quranic memorization yeah, yes, centers yes. and the yeah. like. Those are different from the Madrasa, madrasa. we're talking mm -hmm. about the, where they do they serve like Talibin, Islamic exactly. Institute, yeah, yeah. Banding yeah. Drame, yeah. something. So, so basically when we monitor their achievement in terms of these minimum standards that are developed by the Ministry of Basic and Secondary Education, and when, when we talk about the minimum standards, they are what is expected of an institution under MOPSI to achieve. Yeah? These madrasas have also interpreted those, they have translated the minimum standards into Arabic, and they are trying to achieve them, which means they are in line with whatever the conventional schools are doing. So when we go out to monitor, you will realize that some students in the madrasas, in terms of performance in mathematics, if you look at our curriculum, they perform very well. They can even perform better than those in the conventional schools. So when they move from that um, uh, part of education to the conventional, you will realize that catching up is so quick that's why some of them, they perform very well. I could remember teaching a student from the madrasa institutions at grade 9, and the child just did extremely very well in the, in the Gabeke. 
from the madrasa to grade nine, and then that's how he goes. So it's actually a very good thing that um, Mopsi is looking into all those domains of education. You want to comment? Uh, yes, I just, <coughs> just want to add that um, Mopsi is not looking at changing what they have. They are left with the system. We're just trying to bring and them up to power where they'll be more market marketable. Yeah. And, and um, discussions are in progress with YA to see what can be done mm -hmm. for them to be able to have those th exam, to be able to see those exams. Another thing is the Majalis, the Dara. Mm -hmm. You're talking about we are looking into those schools. We are looking into those setups too. We don't want to change what they have. We go over there and see what we can do um, to chip in so that the children, when they leave the Dara, they'll be able to have life skills and they'll be able to communicate in English a little bit. Mm -hmm. So we, we are running a pilot system that's called um, the conditional cash yeah, transfer, transfer yeah. mm -hmm. where we've identified some Daras from region one here right to region six. We've started with seven, we, are, we have 17 of them as of now, where the time the children go to beg around, I know we have few of them around this end, but it still exists. The time they go to beg around for food, We've given them a token amount for them to be fed so that they won't go out, they'll stay. And the, 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 um, the instructions that have been identified, they'll mm -hmm. go into the dar at that time and give them literacy and numeracy and a little bit of um, life food skills. skills yeah. So that by the time they finish the dar, they should be able to um, assimilate, they should be able to speak English, they should be able to communicate, they should be able to use those skills sustain to be able to survive and sustain themselves. So, mm -hmm. so that we'll reach everybody, so that we'll be able to reach every child. Thank you so much, Maria Machau. Um, also, um, is education free in this country? If so, up to what, which level? <laughs> because we know we heard about free education. Uh, but uh, some people say they are still pay anyway. paying school fees. <laughs> yes, I mean, uh, I would want to say, yes, it's free. But there is no free lunch. No. We have to accept <laughs> that as a fact of life. There is no free lunch. When we say education is free, what we are saying is tuition fees is free and the basic books are free. But as a parent, you are supposed to provide uniform for your child. You are supposed to provide stationery for your child. You are supposed to provide lunch money for your child. So then we cannot say it's free because of those things that parents are still I mean, contributing to. So tuition fee and books? Yeah. Free? Free. OK. Tuition fee is free. Up to which level? From grade or ECD to grade 12. Oh. If you are in the public or assisted schools, that's what we call the grand aid. Yeah. Like the Catholic mission, the Anglican mission, the Methodist yeah. mission, the Ahmadiyya mission. These missions are subvented by government. So they are charging. Mm -hmm. So if your child should go to any public school and they ask you to pay, say no. Mm -hmm. You should not pay. There is nothing like registration fee, development fee, mm -hmm. school fee, study gamma fees. fee, study fee. That is not supposed to. But St. Peter's, for, I for instance, will be different. No, St. Peter's is still part of it. It's a grand, oh, okay. grand aided school. Mm -hmm. Okay. But uh, in the lower basic, they will give them their books. The core books are provided by government. But you exercise books, you as the parent will buy it. Pen, set books, you as a parent will buy it. Books. Yeah. yeah. If you go to the senior secondary school, government pay for the tuition fee. Government also give money for books. Mm -hmm. But we have realized that that is not sufficient to cover for all the books. Because government give for every child $2,000. Of that 2,100, is supposed to be batch, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Then the 1,900 is supposed to be textbooks. Mm -hmm. So if you are in any government school or government assisted school, mm -hmm. this basic thing should be provided by the school because the ministry is paying for those monies. But for example, my child at Gambi High School, they pay 1,900 on your behalf in grade 10. Your books is about 2,800. Mm -hmm. They should give you what is worth of 1,900 and the balance. Yep. Your parents, if they wish, they can. Okay. But schools are also asked not to send anybody home mm -hmm. for failing to get that. Mm -hmm. okay. But as a parent, if you know that my child needs these extra books mm -hmm. to make him or her comfortable in the school or classroom, you can provide it. 
but at least the basic is provided by government. Thank you so much for clarifying that yeah. point. Uh, we have a lot to talk about, yeah. but yeah. we've run out of time. We've run out of time, I'm sorry. Uh, that's, okay. that's it. Uh, probably at some point we'll, no we'll, we'll sit again and discuss okay. more, but we've actually run out of time. Um, yeah. um, but it's actually um, very interesting, and I uh, would like to thank uh, uh, Mr. Adama Jimba Job and then Andrew Gomez and, of course, Maria Machau. Uh, the discussion was very fruitful and I hope the general public will understand how you operate and, 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 and what's happening in the country in terms of trying to improve quality education. Mm -hmm. um, viewers, thank you very much for watching and um, this is all we have for you today. Um, have a pleasant evening. Mm -hmm.